Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by the deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Well, about uh, halfway through last year, began thinking about a question and began to get some leaders together from Shoreline Church to grapple with this question. It's an important one. It seems like a simple question, but it's very complex. And here's the question. What does a spiritually mature person look like? What does it look like when somebody is actually growing and becoming more mature in terms of their Christian faith, becoming more and more like Jesus. And, and so we were grappling with this because the Bible calls those who follow Jesus. If you're here as a follower of Jesus, you know this. If you're still sort of investigating the Christian faith, you have to understand it's not just about a moment where you say, I put my faith in Jesus, but then it becomes a life time of following Jesus, walking with him, and moving toward him, becoming more like Jesus. And it's fair to say, what, how do we know when we're getting there? And, and so there's this amazing passage in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is talking about God's people, the church. He's talking about maturity, and he says, you know, God gives leaders in the church, he gives these people with different giftings to help people grow up in their faith. And here's the goal. This is Ephesians 4, beginning of verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. And listen to this attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the goal, that we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Which means if you're a Christian, the goal is that the fullness of Christ would be formed in you. And you would look like, sound like, act like, think like Jesus in every possible way. How's that going for you? Anybody there yet? <laughs> Anybody arrived? The longer I walk with Jesus, the more I realize how long that road is. And I realize how much there is to grow. But the vision is to understand that we're maturing. We're growing in faith. But how do you know? And so the middle of last year, I began to pull together some leaders around the table and say, we need to think together as a congregation, as Shoreline Church. And if you're visiting here for the AT&T or some other event, we're glad you're here. It's going to be a, a message that will touch you where you're at. But we're in this six-week series talking about momentum. What does it look like to be moving towards this goal of becoming more like Jesus? Because here's the thing, we don't arrive. Not in this life we don't. We continue moving on this journey towards being more like Jesus and we're gaining momentum towards it. So I bring around the table certain people. So I brought uh, Pastor Roy Pina. And Pastor Roy is our pastor of Family Life Ministries, but he specializes with children. And he works with volunteers. We have about 240 volunteers in a normal month working with children in our church. And he oversees all of that. So I said, you know, Pastor Roy, I want you to think about, pray about, and figure out what does a fully spiritually formed, mature, godly five-year-old girl look like? <laughs> okay? Work on that. I'm serious. You know, what does a mature, godly, growing seven-year-old boy look like? It's an important question. Because we'll say, well, how's that, you know, is that person a Christian? Oh, yeah. Are they growing their faith? It seemed to be. What does that mean? I mean, what does it really mean to say that we're moving towards Jesus, becoming more like him? And then I brought around the table Danny Killo. Danny oversees our middle school ministries. He invests in and pours into, with a bunch of parent volunteers and other volunteers through home groups and here on our campus, middle school kids. Danny, what is a mature, godly, growing with momentum, you know, young Christian woman in seventh grade look like? How do we know that she's growing in her faith? What does an eighth grade boy look like when he's growing to be more like Jesus? Danny, work on that. I got Tyler Smith around the table. And I said, Tyler, what does a mature high school student look like? What, what is a, a high school student who's, who's, who's growing into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? And how do we know if a high school student is growing in their faith and moving forward? Tyler, work on that. Think about it. Pray about it. I pulled Nate Harney around the table because Nate works with our young adults here at the church. 
And I said, Nate, what does a mature and godly growing college student or young professional in their, you know, sort of 18 to 25, 26 range, that time of life, what does it look like? How do they know when they're moving forward into godliness and becoming more like Jesus, that they're growing to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? What does that look like? Work on that. And I pulled Nate Harney, Zach Harney, and I said, Zach, he over, he's our pastor of spiritual development. So all of this stuff that happens with growth groups and Bible studies, all this stuff for adults in the church, he leads that. Zach, what does a mature, godly, growing with momentum 35-year-old look like? 45-year-old, 75-year-old, 95-year-old. And I had all of them over a five-month period asking the question for their area. And then I brought them together every month. And I said, let's talk together. Let's pray together. Let's think together. What are the common things that we think can in be indicators that we're heading in the right direction? So that we can share it with the whole congregation and we can build our ministry for the years to come around a pathway that gets us walking towards becoming more like Jesus. So it's kind of like an exciting process, doesn't it? So I, we've been doing this for about, for about six months now. And this series grows out of that. This series is really the, the six primary indicators or markers that a five-year-old girl or a 95-year-old man could all look for in their lives and say, am I growing to be more like Jesus? Am I becoming more like him in very specific, noticeable ways? We came up with six clear indicators that we are gaining spiritual momentum in these areas. We're growing to be more mature as Christ followers. Now, here's the key. And we decided this as a group as we talked and prayed together over this time period. We are not talking about arriving, but about momentum in the right direction. It's not about saying, okay, look, I'm mature. I've gotten there. I'm done. But in this life, if you're a follower of Jesus or if you become a follower of Jesus, the goal is to start on a journey where you're gaining momentum and you're moving towards Jesus, becoming more like Jesus, thinking like him, feeling the way he feels with his heart, living like Jesus would want you to live, and you're becoming more like him. And for some people, that journey looks kind of like this. And they may move kind of slowly, and just because of challenges and life things, there's, I'm just battling to take, but they're, but they're moving forward. Praise God. For some people, they're moving a little bit more rapidly. But the key is that we don't compare to each other. The key is that we have spiritual momentum, that we're going, we're moving towards Jesus. And when we get further down the road, we can look back and say, look, I'm, I'm growing. I'm moving in the right direction. And it's going to be a different pace. It's going to look different for different ones. But there's these six indicators, these six markers that we all of us came up with for every age group. So last week, we started talking about this. And, and Pastor Zach talked about this momentum one, the first thing, character, that looks more and more like Jesus. And he talked specifically about humility and less pride. Godly, Christ-like humility and less pride. But, but the first thing we realized was this. And this is what Zach started us off with last week. Our character and our hearts have to change. Because if they don't, and we do a bunch of good spiritual stuff, but our hearts are rotten, guess what? It's just not good. We do all kinds of spiritual things. So we say, okay, here's some markers of spiritual, spiritual maturity. People start doing them, they start saying, oh man, I am so much more spiritually mature than you. I'm not going to say it, but I just know in my heart, I am way more Jesus-y than you are. You know, I am way more, and that's, I, sometimes I throw out my seminary theological terms, and I apologize, but you know, Jesus-y is one of those terms you got to learn. But you, know, you start to get this attitude that says, you know, almost like my spiritual growth is about racing you and being better than you and comparing to you and saying, aren't I wonderful? And all of a sudden, pride seeps in, and no matter what you're doing for Jesus, it stinks. You're, so we started last week with, with our heart and our character. When, when you're getting spiritual momentum and you're following Jesus more clo closely, you're becoming more like him. His character marks your character. The fruits of the Spirit begin to grow in you with love and joy and, and, and self-control. And you, know, you have the character of Christ. And humility marks everything you do. And pride becomes less and less the focus. And a humble heart like Jesus becomes who you are. And when that's happening, the other five markers can make sense. And if it's not and you start doing the other things with the wrong heart, it just starts to be a real mess. So we started there, and if you weren't here last week, go online, watch that sermon, kind of get caught up with us on that first topic of character being changed to be more like Jesus. Today we're looking at the second marker of spiritual momentum, of becoming more like Jesus. And here's number two. Knowing, loving, and following God's word. Knowing, loving, and following God's word. If you want to know that you're making spiritual momentum, you're heading towards Jesus, you find yourself, you're knowing the word of God more, you're opening it, reading it more, you're learning from it. It's challenging your heart. You're studying, you're going deep. 
And then it's changing your life and you're becoming a person who kind of, kind of is shaped by what God has revealed in his word. And whether you're a five-year-old or a 95-year-old, you should be moving down a road of knowing this book. If you're a Christian and you say, am I growing as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus? One of those markers is this. You're going to know and love and follow the word of God more closely. And so each week we're going to talk about the, the idea of how right thinking impacts right living. And, and, the, the theologi- and these are actual official theological terms. Uh, jesus isn't, just to let you know. That's just sort of a, a word. But these, uh, the two words are orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy and orthodoxy. And I've introduced these words before, but I want to touch on them again. Orthodoxy is right belief and right thinking based on Scripture. Orthopraxy is right living because you know what's true in Scripture. So here's a little definition. When we have solid, biblical, theologically sound beliefs, that's orthodoxy, these can lead to a life that reflects the heart, the truth, and the glory of the living God. That's orthopraxy, or our practice is is a response to orthodox believing. If we don't have the right thinking, we can't be living the right way. So when it comes to the word of God, I want to give you three things. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. Three things that would be an orthodox understanding of the Bible. What if we understand what the Bible teaches us of itself? (laughs) <laughs> and if we believe that, we head down the right road. So three things. Number one, and if you have your Bibles, turn, uh, turn to, uh, to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. But in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, we learn this, that the Bible is the very word of God from beginning to end, and it is breathed from the very heart of God. That, that this book, the Bible, from beginning to end, is from God, and it's breathed by his spirit. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, we read this. All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And keep your Bibles open, because we're going to look back at this passage again in a moment. All scripture is God-breathed. If you want to have an orthodox understanding of the Bible and have it impact your life, you need to understand that this book is breathed, is given by the very spirit of the living God. And it's God's truth from beginning to end. The second thing is this. An orthodox understanding of the Bible. All we need to guide our lives and guide us in living for the glory of God is found in the pages of the Bible. Everything you need to live the way, to have the life of momentum moving where God wants you to be is found in the Bible. You want to know how to conduct yourself in the business world? It's in the Bible. Read the book of Proverbs. It'll turn you upside down as a business person if you're not on the right track. It'll set you on the right course. If you want to know how to function in relationships, how to deal with conflict, if you want to know about understand marriage, <coughs> the Bible answers these questions for us. Now, some of you might say, well, wait a minute, time out, time out. You know, how, does the Bible say who I'm supposed to marry? I mean, it doesn't say like on, on, page, on page, you know, 427, Mary, Sherry, Lynn, Vleem, you'll meet her. She's from Michigan, you'll meet her. You know, it doesn't work that way, okay? So it's not... It's not answering, though, but, but, but the kind of person to look for, the kind of person to become, to be the right person for them, it's all there. And what happens is the Bible is so clear about so many things, it gives you the path to walk on, and then as you walk on that path, you look to the Holy Spirit, you pray, you use the mind that God has given you, you get wisdom from other people, and those other detailed pieces come together as God leads you through that. But the Bible answers all the big questions of life. It really does. And, and so you see again in 2 Timothy 3, All scripture is God breathed and is useful, listen to this, for teaching, so to instruct us, for rebuking, showing us where we're off track, for correcting, getting us back on track, and for training in righteousness to make us righteous people, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped, I love this, for every good work. All that God wants you to do, it's laid out here in his word. That's orthodox understanding of the Bible. It's breathed by the spirit of God, it's God's truth from beginning to end. And it will guide our lives where we need to go. Here's the third thing. Third of many things, but the third I'm going to talk about today. An orthodox understanding of the Bible. Simply knowing the information in the Bible and being a student of the Bible is not enough. We need to love the God who gave us the Bible and follow what he teaches us in the pages of Scripture. It's not enough just to know what the book says. I have a bunch of data, a bunch of, oh yeah, I've read it many times, I've got all the information. We have to be transformed by God's leading and speaking and teaching from his word. It's not enough to know what it says. We have to live out what it calls us to do. In James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, we read this. A great challenge. Do not merely listen to the word, meaning scripture. Don't just listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says 
It's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, into God's word that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. An orthodox understanding of the Bible is this. It's not just meant to be a book of information. It is meant to be a book of transformation. So we say, God, what do you say? What does it mean for me? And we live it out. We get transformed by God's word. And that sends us, that propels us forward with momentum in our spiritual lives. So when we embrace the Bible as the word of God and true from beginning to end, when we love the scriptures and seek to be people who study and follow what God has taught us in his word, our lives will be transformed, or at least they should be. And here's the trick. I mean, if you say, I'm reading the Bible, I'm understanding what it says, this should lead to life transformation. This should, this should propel you forward in knowing and loving and following the word of God. But sometimes we find ourselves just kind of stuck, and we're not making momentum in our understanding of God's word. We're not growing, and sometimes we find ourselves doing this. We're kind of backpedaling a little bit. We're moving the wrong direction when it comes to, we're moving away from God in terms of what his word teaches and calls us to do. And, and I think that there's all kinds of stuff that gets thrown at us to keep us from having that spiritual momentum. And, and I call those things that get thrown at us momentum busters. Those things that keep, you know, we find ourselves, you, you've all, if you're a Christian, you've had most of I'm going to grow in God's word. You make commitments, you start to read it, you're going deeper, and all of a sudden you get stuck. What happened? Probably a momentum buster. Something came up that stopped you from moving forward. So sometimes if you kind of own and name those things, it helps you identify them and fight against them. So I want to give you four momentum busters, four things that if you're not careful, these will keep you from knowing and loving and following God's word. And I just want to name them and call them what they are, all right? So here's one momentum buster. Number one, letting our life be dominated by and consumed with things that are not nearly as important. One of the things that can stop your momentum from really knowing and loving and following this book is just stuff that isn't nearly as important as knowing God and following him, but it just fills our time. And I mean fills and fills and fills our time. So I want to give you some examples of some of those things that by, kind of by in and of themselves, they aren't bad things, but they consume time. They could be used for better things. And I'm hoping in the next couple of minutes to irritate, bug, or offend everybody. And, and if I don't, talk to me afterwards, and I'll, trust me, I'll offend you. Uh, so, but I want, to, I want to give you something that you might stop and go, you know what, if I'm honest, I get kind of caught, I spend a lot of time on that. And it's not as important as really growing to know Jesus more. So here's some of those things that, that may kind of dominate or consume our time. Here's one. Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, <laughs> TV and movies, binge watching. Um, that's a new term in American binge watching. People who will, will watch show after show after show, sometimes for like 10 hours, 15 hours, 20, 25, 24, 40. People for like for two days straight gather and watch a show, show after show after show after show after show. And I'm not saying that isn't deep and meaningful and rich. I'm just saying uh, it might not be the best thing you could do with your life. Um, so, so, but there, and again, there's nothing wrong with watching a TV show as long as it's not, you know, something that's perverse or horrible, but, just, but it's, it's just, it fills time. Uh, Nielsen who rates TV shows and monitors American consumption of media, came up with this. The average American, and this, this was shocking to me, the average American over two years old, this starts with three-year-olds, okay? Average American from three-year-olds and up spends an average of 32 to 40 hours a week consuming media. 32 to 40 hours a week, or 160 hours a month of just watching stuff, average American. Might that, I'm just spitballing here, but might that 160 hours, part of it at least, be used more productively? I'm just, I'm just saying maybe. Anybody, maybe? Um, apparently not. Um, but, but, you know, that, but that's one of those things. And for some of you, you spend a lot of time doing that. And the same, the same person who says, you know, I just, I just can't get in the, I just don't, I just can't make time to get 15 minutes a day to read the Bible or 20 minutes a day to read the Bible, but they're watching five hours of media a day. You go, is that, is there something maybe wrong there? I, I think there might be. Here's another one, just to offend another group of folks. Uh, video games. <laughs> video games. You go online for video game addiction in Monterey, and I actually saw a list of all different counselors that work with people with video game addictions. Two of them go to Shoreline. I recognize their pictures. Um, not, not, the, not the addicts, but the counselors. 
There's, there's nobody at Shoreline struggling with it. I'm talking about other churches here, not Shoreline. But, um, but video games. There's people that will spend hours every night consumed with video games. Now, playing a video game isn't by definition evil, but if you're spending a big chunk of your life and you're not growing in God's word, maybe you could think how you're using your time. So for another group of you, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Snapchat, and it goes on and on and on. Some of you go, well, yeah, I would never sit and watch TV. All day. I would but you're just, you know, tech, and you're posting, and you're picturing, and, you're, and it's your whole life, you can't go five or ten minutes without having to be consumed with that. And maybe, just maybe, there's other ways to spend your time that may be more valuable. And that's not that that's bad or wrong, but you could say, I can tone it down a little bit. Now, to offend myself, um, sports, watching, following, playing, reading about, statistics, all that information. You put any sport event in front of me, and I'm just, I'm in, I'm watching, I'm there. I have, to be, I have to be careful of that. But you have people that spend huge amounts of time consuming sports stuff. And they say, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Yes, it is, to, up to a point, right? I mean, you get the idea, right? This is all up to a point. Even reading, even with books. You know, reading, by definition, is a good thing. It grows the mind, right? But, but you can, you're, even that, I know, I, I have to be careful when I start reading in a series of books because if I start reading, I started reading, a, I read a science fiction book a while back that was part of a quintet. So I'm, I'm reading on my iPad, so there's five books, and so I read the first one, and when I finish reading it, you know what pops up? Would you like to buy the next book in the series? Okay. Yes, I would. <laughs> After, and so I buy it. And that was like 600 pages. I read that one. Would you like to read book three in the series? I absolutely would. And like three months later, I'm, not, I'm like, Man, I just filled in all the cracks of my extra time with, with reading. The, and it was, a, it was an interesting book, of, you know, a series of science fiction books. But I, I went, wait a minute. Is that, do you understand what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with it, but I have to keep a balance there. And if you've got some other area that is for you, just fill in the blank there. Sometimes our spiritual momentum when it comes to God's word gets is a, is a momentum buster and gets stopped because just because of stuff that's not bad. It just takes a lot of time. And if you find yourself saying, I really don't have time to dig into God's word. I don't really have time. But you find out you're spending 10, 12, 15, 20, 25, 30 hours a week doing some other thing. Maybe it's time to go, maybe I'll just kind of carve out. You know, I'm doing that five hours a day. I'll spend an hour a day getting into God's word and only spend four hours a day doing that thing. And it would, it would enrich your life in incredible ways and propel you forward. But watch that buster of just time being filled with that kind of stuff. Momentum buster number two, being a hearer of the word and not doing what it says. If you want to see, I think one of the ways that our momentum towards growth happens is when we're actually opening the book, we're reading it, and God's teaching us stuff, but he tells us to do something. We hear him call us to do something, and we just don't want to do it. So we kind of say no. And now we're being a hearer of the word, but not a doer, and we find ourselves getting stuck there. So you're reading a passage, and it talks about forgiving. I mean, it talks about forgiveness, forgiving those who've wronged you as God forgave you in Christ. And you're like, and all of a sudden in your heart, it's like the Holy Spirit says, and I'm talking about your sister, you know, <laughs> or, say, or I'm talking about your friend who you're not speaking to anymore. Or I'm, and, and all of a sudden, you know, you know what I'm talking about when you're reading, the Bible talks about a topic and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit goes, and it's this. So now it's time to make that call to check, you know, and so you, and you know, God's calling you to forgive and you say, no, not doing it. And you freeze there. I think that's a momentum buster. It stops you from moving forward. And then when you act on what God's prompted you to do, it moves you forward again. So be careful when you're reading the word, when God is calling you to do certain things or live a certain way or change an attitude, be careful about telling God no. Because I think that that's a moment, momentum buster. Number three, consistent and persistent disobedience to what the Bible teaches and what the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. So sometimes we, our momentum gets busted because, because we're just not doing what it says. Sometimes it gets busted because we're doing the opposite. So you read in the scriptures and it talks about gossiping and how you shouldn't gossip. Do you know that gossip's a sin? It actually is. And, 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 you're, and, and, you, so, and, and you're, instead of saying, okay, I won't gossip and, and, and kind of you know, doing that, or you, instead, you actually say, well, I'm actually, every chance I get, I'm talking about other people. I'm actually going backwards. I mean, the Bible says don't gossip and don't speak ill of others. And every time someone's not with me, I find myself talking about them or listening to someone else talk about them. By the way, that's still part of gossip. It takes two people, right? And so I find myself going backwards of what I know God's teaching me. And I realize I'm not getting spiritual momentum. I'm actually going the wrong direction. Be honest when you find yourself living in a way totally contrary to what you know God's called you to do and say, I'm going to change that. I'm going to start moving forward. And that will unleash you from that momentum buster. And one more. Momentum buster number four. 
not believing the Bible is actually the word of the living God, but rather it's a human invention with some nice suggestions for people who need a little, little morality, you know, a little to guide their life. It's, it's not really God's word. It's kind of a human thing, but it's, ni- and it's nice, and it's got some nice stories, and Jesus was a good guy. And, and if you view it that way, it's really not going to change your life much. Because if you view the Bible that way, you're going to pick and choose what you like, and you're going to throw out what you don't like, because it's just a human invention. And if that's a challenge for you, if you're grappling with it, I want to give you a book to, if you're, if you're a student, if you really like to learn and you want to grapple with this, there's a book called Scripture and Truth by D.A. Carson and John Woodbridge. Scripture and Truth by D.A. Carson and John Woodbridge. And, and there's lots of other great books that kind of walk through how the Bible came together, how God inspired it through real people in real history and time. And we can give you some resources if you want to grapple with that. But I, there's something about understanding that this is God's word. And if I don't believe it is, that's a momentum buster. I mean, if, oh, it's a nice book. It's got good moralisms. Yeah, I'll, you kinda, you're not going to really move forward because this doesn't challenge you. It doesn't convict you because it's just people. But when you know it's God and he speaks to you, that'll wake you up. That'll challenge you. That'll move you forward. So there's things that will kind of be momentum busters. They're going to slow us down. But there's also things that are momentum boosters, things that will propel you forward. And if you're saying, you know, I I want to grow to know, and again, this is one of these six markers that we're going to be looking at as a church for years to come. Say, how do I know I'm growing to be more like Jesus? I'm growing healthy in my my faith because I'm learning to know and love and follow God's word. What will propel you forward? If you're going like this, what will make you go like this? A little faster. If you're going like this, what'll make you go? You know, what's going to move you forward in this journey of spiritual growth through God's word? And here's some momentum boosters. And if you're a note taker in your outline, there's a place to kind of fill in some stuff here on the momentum boosters. Number one, have your own Bible, open it every day, and including at church. I would encourage you to bring your, to get your Bible and bring it with you to church. If you don't have a Bible, you can go to our cafe. We sell Bibles uh, in our cafe, and we basically do it at our cost. For the cost of the Bible and whatever we did for you know, shipping to get it here and all that and handling. But it's basically we do it for no, making no profit on sales of Bibles. We have study Bibles and a lot of good Bibles. And if you just say, I really don't want to buy a Bible, but I'd like a Bible, go by the Connection Center. They will give you a free Bible. And it's the exact one we use here on Sundays. Same, you know, same translation. So if you want to buy one, check those out. If you want a free one. But we want to make sure everyone has a Bible. And I would challenge you, bring it with you. When you come to church and take some notes in your Bible, keep learning that way and also open it every day. And that leads to the second thing, momentum booster number two. Not only having a Bible, not only opening it, but here, this is it, reading it and studying your Bible. You're going, well, I can open it. That's easy. I'm talking about reading it and studying your Bible. Have a good study Bible and a good commentary. If you want to go deeper, uh, so this is kind of interesting. Here's my study Bible. This is my NIV study Bible, exact same translation. This is my NIV Bible with just the biblical text and no study notes. Let me notice the difference of thickness, right? Because this one, my study Bible, it has all the biblical text up here, and then there's a line, and below it are all academic study notes, or devotional study notes, or reflection, historical background. So it starts talking about something that Samuel did, and he, you know, this is, this is centuries before Jesus, and it's a different culture and a time. That's kind of weird. I look at it, oh, that's what, and it gives some background and history and information and clarity, and so I would encourage you to get a good study Bible. And again, we have probably 20 different study Bibles. They're all NIV in our, in our cafe. Uh, and then also a good commentary. And this one, the NIVAC, the NIV Application Commentary Series, there's one of these on every book of the Bible. Some of them have more than one book in them. This is like the Gospel of Mark. And it's all going deeper into the Gospel of Mark. And I would encourage you, if you want to start with a commentary, start with this one, the NIV Application Commentary Series. A friend of mine innovated this whole concept, oversaw the entire development of this over about a 20-year time period, and it's great. It's solid scholarship. It's biblical, theologically sound. Not every commentary, some commentaries are going to be way out there and pretty wacky. This series, all the scholars are really solid. And so, and even right now, my, my daily devotions, I'm using uh, this one. This is a new series. There's only like five or six of the entire series out yet, but Teach the Text, which is one for pastors and teachers and leaders. And I use it. I'm using this every day with my, am I going second time through first Corinthians uh, in over the last month or so. And I use this every single day and it gives me deeper insight to what the scriptures say. This isn't the word of God. This is a person's thoughts, but a brilliant scholar giving perspective on the background so that you can study and go deeper than just reading, but studying and knowing God's word more thoroughly and more strongly. So read and study your Bible. It's the second thing that'll boost you forward. Number three, share what God has taught you with someone else and try to do it every day. I'm serious. Every day, if there's one thing God teaches you, one truth, one concept, one challenge, share it with someone. Share it with one of your kids. Share it with your parents. Share it with your spouse. Share it with some friends. Share it with your roommates. Share it with another Christian. Share it with somebody who's who's not a Christian, but they're a friend of yours. 
You say, yeah, I was going to read my Bible this morning. It was talking about, you know, go back to the topic of, of gossip and how it's really wrong to do it. And I realized I kind of gossip sometimes. So if you ever notice me doing it, will you point it out to me? Now, that leads to some conversations, doesn't it? Is gossip really wrong? You really want me to tell you when you're doing it? Yeah, because I don't want to do it anymore. And all of a sudden, you have this conversation about how God's changing your life. And that might just impact them to realize that there's a God who actually wants to change their life. But share what you're learning. That, if you share what you're learning every day with somebody, it will propel you forward because you'll be learning more as you share with them, and they'll be learning more, and they'll propel them forward. We need to do that together. Number four, momentum booster. Be tenacious and relentless about life application and action that grows out of Bible reading and study. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Moved. If God teaches you something, if God challenges you to change this attitude, to stop this action, to start doing this good thing, take action. When you take that action, it will propel you forward and you'll become more and more the person God wants you to be. And then number five, the last one, is use a simple process for personal Bible reading. And I'm going to give you a six words that you can write down, and you'll be able to remember these things. And just simply, as you, you say, well, I've never really read, studied the Bible or read the Bible much. I don't know where to start. I would say, first of all, start, if you're not sure where to start, take your bulletin, and on the back page, the very back page, is a Bible reading guide for this week. So Sunday, Isaiah 6, that's today. Monday, Genesis 2. And it's also on our website. And that's there every week. Those Seven passages or chapters of the Bible will get you ready for next Sunday's message when I preach about the third marker of a mature Christian. All right? Those are all designed to prepare you for that because I picked those for next week's sermon. And so you can say, okay, now I'm going to read those. I sit and read them. Well, here's the six-step process. First, pray. So you find your place that you sit down where you study and you just sit down and you say, or you pick a place that maybe you've never done this before and you say, you start like that. Prayer, something like this. God, I'm about to open your word. I want to learn from you. I want to see my life changed. So meet me by your spirit and teach me. Make me a different person because I've been in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not talking about a two-hour prayer thing. I'm talking about just asking God to teach you, to speak to you. Start there. Before you even open the Bible, God help me, God teach me. Second thing, read it. So there, I've got my chapter I'm going to read or two chapters, whatever you're going to be reading. You read the passage, asking God to speak to your heart. Number three, you study which means you can use some study notes from your, from your study Bible, or you can use a commentary, or you can do some, some diff, different notes. Kind of go in deeper and say, what's going on behind the scenes? So you're reading the passage again, but this time you're kind of being more reflective. You're trying to get historical background, setting, more of the storyline there. And then apply. So what? So, okay, God, so what? What difference should this make in my life today? Every day when I open the Bible, there's something that God gives me as a so what? something in my attitude, something, in, something new to do, a way to love, a way to care, a person to communicate with in some way, to apologize to or to check in with. If I just ask the Lord to speak, and I encourage you to do that and, and have some action, be a doer of the word, and then pray again. So before you're done, say, okay, God, this has been great to be in your word. Thank you for what you've taught me. Give me the strength to live it out, to remember it, so I don't just kind of walk away and go, I'm done for the day. And Lord, in some way, make me come, become more like Jesus because I've been in your word. And then tell someone, share something you learned. If you do those six, six things in the course of a day, it will propel, I mean, that is a momentum booster. And I think that one of the strongest ways to grow your faith and become more like Jesus is to know his word, to love his word, and to live it out. So here's three questions you can ask yourself periodically to see how you're doing in this area of your life. Questions to help me discern if I'm gaining spiritual momentum in my relationship with Jesus when it comes to knowing, loving, and following God's word. Now watch how simple these questions are. Do I love the Bible more today than I, do, than I did six months ago? And because if you're getting into this word, you'll, you, you don't worship it. You only worship Jesus, but you can love his truth. So am I loving God's word? Do I, get, do I get excited to dig into it and let him speak to me? Second question, do I know more scripture than I did six months ago? Do I just know more? Do I understand more of what God's word says? Because when I know it, it allows me to then be able to live it. And then third, is my life different today than it was six months ago because I'm reading and following the teaching of the Bible? And how have I changed? You, you want to see your spiritual life, if you're a follower of Jesus or if you become a Christian, you want to see your spiritual life be propelled forward. You'd be walking down the road, walking with Jesus, growing in his word, making time for it, studying it, digging in, praying about it, living it out, sharing it. And you get to a certain point where you stop and you look back over the last two months and three months and six months. And you say, man, I'm not the same. I'm loving people in a different way. I'm thinking about people in a different way. I know more of God's love and God's grace. I'm sharing his love with others more freely. And you say, that's, that's momentum. It's not that I've arrived, 
I don't think we arrive till we see Jesus face to face. But I think he takes delight, and we should too, when we're moving forward. And your pace is going to be different than mine if you're just going to look different than me. But if you're walking towards Jesus, growing in his word, loving it, studying it, following it, man, that will propel you forward, whether you're 5 or 95. And that's what God wants for you, to be growing into the, to, into the maturity, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your people here at Shoreline Church, in this room, in the, in the Parkside room, in the cafe, in different parts of the world, wherever you've scattered us, Lord, in each of our services. Lord, we're, we're your people together. Thank you for those that are here today that have still not yet received Jesus, but they love coming to Shoreline or they're here for the first time. And I pray that they would see that the Christian faith isn't just kind of saying, I'm in the club, but it's a transformed life, a relationship with you. Thank you for being with us, meeting us here. Let these truths over these weeks of this Momentum Series sink deep in our souls and make us different people because of them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to hand our venues off to their venue pastors. And can I tell you, this week, there's two things going on this week that you're going to want to know about uh, that'll help you grow in your faith. This Wednesday is night of worship right here in this room at 6.30. I'll do about a 40-minute message on the, the justice and the holiness of God. And we're going to have a worship time. It's going to be amazing. This is, we're going to share communion together. It's our in-depth kind of congregational worship time, learning time, once a month. It's this Wednesday night, 6.30. Come and join us, night of worship. And then Thursday, in the Parkside room over here, is leadership community. If you are a leader in any context, and you want to grow stronger as a leader, it's a free training time. Join us at 6.30. We have four leaders from our community that are going to be in a, in a panel. We've got, we're going to be watching a video of a top leader, and we're going to be talking about it and learning to lead better. And so come join us on Wednesday night, night of worship, Thursday, the leadership community. If you want prayer, these folks up along here along the walls are here to pray for you. Please let them do that. And if you're new at Shoreline, do us one simple thing. On your way out, go out these doors to the left, to the Connection Center, and just say, I'm here for the first time, or I'm new. I've never come to the Connection Center. They want to answer your questions, give you a little gift. Thank you for coming, and kind of bless you and get to know you. So make sure you see them before you leave. God bless you. Have a great week, and open the book every day, and see if God teaches you and transforms you. Amen? Amen. Have a great week.